right, we are all set. Design systems in the wild. So this talk is going to be broken up into two parts. For the first part, we will look at three actual design systems as they exist today. Uh, these are design systems that Sparkbox and I have nothing to do with. Uh, other teams are really smart people, have built these unique systems, and the rest of us are able to look from them, draw inspiration, and then learn from them. Uh, so together we're going to analyze their different parts and we're going to see how they fit into that anatomy of a design system. <clears throat> Next, we're going to talk about the fact that these design systems don't all look the same. Uh, to dig into this uh, topic, we're going to talk about why we build design systems in the first place. And I'm going to share some of the general guidelines that I use when helping clients plan their design systems. But first, uh, I know Ben just introduced me, but we're going to do it again. Um, my name is Casey Bonifacio. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a technical director here at Sparkbox. Uh, I've been here for seven years in a handful of roles, including as a developer. Years ago, I remember getting to work on my very first design system, and I will be honest with you, I didn't know what I was doing back then. Um, and I don't think any of us really knew what we were doing. We were just kind of figuring it out as we went. But over the years, we as an industry have really been figuring out what it takes to make a usable design system. So I'm excited to share some things that I've learned. Let's get started. Now, the first design system I want to talk about is Carbon by IBM, which Ben already talked about a little bit. But before we talk about Carbon, I want to share another resource that's published by IBM, and that is their design language site. The system that IBM is kind of unique compared to some of the other systems I looked at in that they treat their design language as like a separate entity from their design system. Their design language informs the entirety of how IBM is represented regardless of medium, whereas Carbon represents how that design language is used for web interfaces. Um, if we look at the grid system, that their design language uh, gives us, we can see how they're defining, like how information should be laid out on a web page, but also for constructing business cards, um, templating and employee ID badges and graphics. This grid system can even go so far as to lay out physical spaces. Uh, they use it for their trade show displays and office layouts. Now, at this point, I can't really show you how the grid system fits into the anatomy of the design system because we haven't gotten to the design system yet. We are down here at this brand layer. But if we move back over to carbon, uh, we can see start to see how the grid system fits in. So, excuse me, their grid system is nested under their guidelines section um, over in the sidebar. And the documentation found here is only going to be focused, of course, on how this grid is used for the web. So no office floor plans here. The information is going to be one of their core systems uh, within the documentation. So we're going to highlight that core system layer. Um, but the documentation by itself, of course, is just it's a blueprint for implementing a grid system. Um, in practice, it does not make sense for them to have developers try to recreate a new grid system every time they build a new product. So each developer, they would probably go out, they'd build something different, we'd have inconsistencies, and then it gets very difficult to make updates to that grid system later on down the road. So if we head back to Carbon, uh, they have an implementation tab on their uh, documentation page and here's where we are given some grid system assets. This is probably going to be some CSS and sample markup and all the fun stuff. Um, and this can be installed into a project by developers um, where they get all the grid system goodness. Um, and I don't have it on screen, but further down the page, they also have sketch assets for their designers. <clears throat> so now we can highlight the asset section for this uh, core system. And looking at the chart though, all right, we have documentation and we have assets, but what about the processes section? Um, the information for how to use a grid system, uh, it, it kind of feels like a process, but really it's more documentation 
Um, when we're thinking about grid system anatomy, the processes should revolve around how people work with the design system itself. So within carbon in their grid system, we don't really see the processes section, but if we move over, um, they have a section that outlines all the areas of how to design with and develop with and then contribute to the design system. So if I'm a developer who is using carbon and I have a feature request for the grid system, I can find the process for how to submit my request here, which means now we get to highlight that process section for our core systems. Next, the second design system that I'd like to dig into is uh, Atlassian's design system. <laughs> uh, some things to note, uh, Atlassian does have some similarities to Carbon. All right, they both have components and pattern sections. These are things that are fairly common across design systems, uh, but we also have some differences. The section referred to as guidelines, um, Atlassian instead calls that their foundations. Uh, something I want to touch on later is that Atlassian also has a top-level section for their content. Uh, Carbon also had this content section, but they had theirs nested under guidelines. Uh, but we're going to talk about that later. <clears throat> the thing I really want to focus on for Atlassian is their components. Uh, now, their components make up a large portion of their design system. Uh, and many design systems are going to look like this, where the components are like the meat and potatoes of the system. And if we jump into one of the components, in this case, we're going to look at the banner. Uh, we are given examples of different variations of the banner component. Now, these variations have their use cases documented. Um, and we have information as to like when we should use a warning banner versus say an error banner. And this kind of stood out to me at first because um, I noticed they also have a usage tab on this page. And initially I thought that maybe this information on when to use a warning banner or an error banner should live there, but we'll get to that. Uh, the important thing on this page though is right away, they want us to know the different types of banners and they want us to know where we should use them, or excuse me, when we should use them. So this is where we have documentation on the components layer. Now we'll finally, we'll hop back into that usage tab and we can see that we're given some more documentation, but this is more general documentation. It's how to use the banner as a whole component. Like when do we use the banner at all? Not just when we use each variation. So that does help clear up my confusion. Um, I would still call this here documentation on that component layer though. Uh, but if we were to scroll down, which we can't with the screenshot, unfortunately, uh, we would see that they have best practices for content and accessibility guidelines. This is giving us documentation now for that foundational layer. Uh, the page is still about the banner and the uh, foundational documentation is scoped to the banner, but it's still foundational nonetheless. All right. And then the last tab that they have on these pages uh, is where we can find the actual asset for the component. So surprise, we're going to highlight that section in the anatomy um, where we are delivering assets on the component layer. Um, now, without digging too deep into their code, um, there is most likely a layer or two that we're not seeing in the documentation. Those would be like the core system layers um, and maybe even some tokens. Right. They do have a grid system. They have an icon system, color, and typography. Um, and we do need those things to build out a component such as this. But in this case, they didn't really feel they didn't feel it was necessary to cross-link everything. Um, but know that the chart's not complete. They do exist. Uh, we just aren't seeing them right away. <coughs> All right. And finally. The last design system that I want to look at is Workbench by Gusto. So once again, we have some of the same patterns from other design systems. Uh, they have a similar section for foundations, components, and patterns. Like Atlassian, they pull content as well as resources up to the top level section. Similar to Carbon, they have a roadmap and changelog section. 
Um, carbon has something similar. They call theirs what's happening. And the thing I want to focus here, though, is their patterns. Um, patterns isn't something that you see right away in the anatomy of a design system, but I do promise it's there. <clears throat> so uh, right now, Workbench only has one pattern um, in their design system, and that is for their forms. And when we look at the forms pattern, the first thing that we see is the anatomy of a form. And the thing that separates this form pattern from a component is just that it's made up of components. Um, some of the documentation that we see here is actually component specific. Uh, the validation message, for instance, um, is tied to the field component. Uh, but here it's nice to see how the different fields and their different states can work together in the context of a full form. It's nice to see how everything works together. Now we're going to jump back to our anatomy chart and we are going to highlight the components uh, layer for the documentation section. If we go back to that page and we scroll down a bit, <clears throat> we're able to see a little bit about how the spacing system works with a form. So once again, uh, some cases, the spacing is component specific. Uh, I think the radio button in the checkbox is a good example of that. The spacing between those elements and their text, like that's that's really component specific. Um, but we also get to see the spacing between the different inputs um, and elements for the form. So if we were just looking at those uh, components by themselves, we might not see the relationship and how they work together with all the spacing. So we're going to go ahead and jump back here and we're going to highlight the core system documentation section. <laughs> and then, of course, we're going to scroll down the page a little bit more and we're going to find some form guidelines. Uh, these guidelines in particular are about the form imp and input accessibility. Um, so this is a foundational part of the design system. And we are going to go back and highlight that foundational uh, documentation section. Something to keep in mind, similar to when we looked at Atlassian's components, there probably are tokens um, that are being used like for the spacing system. Uh, but of course, as outsiders looking in, we can't see that right now. So I'm going to ignore it, but just know that it's most likely there. Um, but pretending we have tokens and stuff, um, we what we can see is that this pattern section is involving all layers of the anatomy chart. If we look at Workbench's patterns overview page, we get to see their definition of what a pattern is. These conventions provide a framework of guidelines, documentation, and components that help us solve common use cases in our platform. So for them and for many people, patterns <coughs> excuse me, are the best practices for how different parts of a design system should work together. We can't fit them into a single layer of the design system, anatomy, and honestly, not even a single section, right? They could encompass uh, assets and processes, um, but all parts of anatomy, the anatomy can and should be represented within these patterns. All right, so we just look, analyzed three different design systems. And at the beginning, I mentioned that they were all going to look different. Now, I wasn't just talking about the design of their websites. They each have different methods of organization and they each cater to different audiences. While the different elements that make up the systems do fit into the layers uh, and sections for the anatomy of a design system, the way the elements are put together in the design system itself is unique. So now let's talk about why that's the case. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to share five things that are really important to consider when building your own design system. The first thing I wanna share is that you need to identify your problems. This is why each of those design systems look different. It's because they are each solving different problems. <laughs> For you as a designer, a developer, project manager, stakeholder, my first suggestion is to identify the problems that you need your design system to solve 
before you start building it. Now, I was recently uh, reading a book, it's called The Product Book, um, and they share a quote from Simon, Simon Sinek, uh, which he gave in a TED, TED Talk quite a few years ago. Um, if your company started because somebody said, this is a cool idea, can we sell it? Rather than this invention would make people's lives better because you have a solution looking for a problem. Now, even though he was talking about creating a product, what he's saying does apply to building design systems as well. You cannot just wake up one day and say, I'm going to build a design system because everyone else has one and have it work out for you. <clears throat> the reason we build design systems is because they are a tool that is used to solve problems. If they didn't solve problems, then we really wouldn't invest time and money into building them. And if you attempt to build a system while skipping this step, you will be building a solution looking for a problem and it probably won't provide as much value as it could. <clears throat> so I mentioned, I was gonna come back to this, um, the example of the content section in Atlassian and Carbon's design systems, right? So Atlassian pulls their content to the top, whereas um, Carbon has theirs nested under their, uh, their guidelines. Now, both of these sections, they do still fit into the anatomy of a design system. Those content guidelines, they fall under documentation for the foundations layer, but they happen to live in different places on the actual websites. Why Atlassian uh, prioritizes content like this could very well be Atlassian solving a problem. Maybe for them, content creation has a lot of business value and it's important to bring that information to the forefront. <clears throat> So it's easy to say that we need to solve our problems though, but how do we actually do that? One of the ways that we can do this is by performing an audit of pain points. Um, this could look like digging into notes from previous project retrospectives. You know, what are the types of problems that your teams are running into? You could review uh, the kinds of bug cards that are popping up in development. Are they just one-offs? Are they recurring? And then we can ask people, <laughs> reach out and ask people what kinds of problems they encounter in their work and what they would like help with. Once we have uh, you know, our findings, once we have some data, then we need to look for themes. Um, these are going to be the problems that we need to solve. Uh, maybe it's difficult to maintain design consistency across products. Maybe our accessibility guidelines are difficult to enforce. Or maybe development workflow is just too complicated and it's slowing down the release of new features. So then we take these problems that we have and we try to think of ways that a design system will help us solve the problems. If it's difficult to maintain design consistency, then perhaps we can provide design teams with Figma assets that will ensure everyone has the same starting point. If our accessibility guidelines are difficult to enforce, maybe we can document our accessibility policy and then include acceptance criteria for individual, into, into, excuse me, individual component documentation. <laughs> and then for our uh, complex workflow, maybe we can deliver those foundational components and systems that can then be imported into the development or uh, workflow for rapid development. We're not quite done there though. We have to take those solutions, of course, and prioritize them. Uh, delivering foundational uh, components so we can speed up development, that sounds like a big win, um, especially if it's affecting you know, your bottom line. Maybe we want to focus on that first. Afterwards, you know, we really care about accessibility and we wanna make sure that we're building accessibly. So we'll prioritize that second. And then finally, we will prioritize creating those Figma assets. So that's of course gonna look unique to every company. This is just a fictional scenario, um, but just look at you there. <clears throat> 
<laughs> um, if you want to learn a little bit more about how we've done this recently with a client, um, please check out this article on the Sparkbox Foundry. Uh, one of our project managers, um, Austin Menhofen, um, recently uh, shared pausing on pain points to improve projects. So it's a good read. All right, next piece of advice. You need to identify your gaps. At some point during this event, you might have started a list of all the things your design system is missing. So next, the next piece of advice, right? We want to use this anatomy uh, as a framework to perform a gap analysis to find all of those missing pieces. To see what this looks like, I've created a spreadsheet. Um, it's a simple spreadsheet. In the columns, I have the different sections that make up the anatomy, um, the assets, the processes, the documentation. And then in the rows, I have the different layers, uh, the foundations, tokens, core systems, and components. When I'm doing this gap analysis, I wanna focus on one piece of the design system at a time. So for this example, we are going to focus on accessibility. <laughs> so let's pretend our accessibility content lives in the guidelines section of our system, kind of like they do in Carbon. Um, and in that, we have some documentation. So I'm going to check that off. I have that. I'm also going to check off the processes in this layer because maybe we've included guidelines for how to test for accessibility. We've also included how to report accessibility issues. And then under assets, I'm going to check off the layer for core systems because maybe we include some sort of tooling for developers so that they can test during the build process. And lastly, we have some individual accessibility content in each of our components. So I'm going to check that off, um, check off documentation for the components layer. <coughs> so now that I know what I have, I can look at what I don't have. In the foundations layer, I have documentation and testing processes outlined, but what if I also were to deliver a checklist um, of things to test as an asset? Or under core systems, we're delivering a testing tool, but maybe it isn't very well documented and people don't know how to use it, or worse, they don't even know it exists. So in performing this gap analysis, not only do I get to see what's missing, but I can start thinking of solutions for the missing pieces. Now, I'm gonna give a word of caution. The anatomy of, of a design system is not a game of cover all bingo. So if your system is missing any of the parts, ask yourself if it is something that would actually provide value. If we go back to that last uh, piece of advice, does it solve a problem? <clears throat> if not, then it's okay to skip it for now. If you find you need to add it later, then add it later. Um, this is because your design system is never going to be complete. Um, it's always going to be a work in progress. So you don't, you shouldn't have to feel like you have to rush to check off all of the boxes right away. Um, you'll find if you try to solve future problems now, you might find yourself rebuilding things uh, because you didn't quite understand the actual problem that needed to be solved. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, now, <laughs> number three, we should start with a good foundation. Um, there aren't very many things that don't start with a good foundation. Um, if I'm going to start an oil painting, I should probably apply, apply a coat of gesso to my canvas before I start. If I'm going to grow a garden, I need to make sure I have good soil. And if I'm going to build a house, I need to start with the literal foundation. So you shouldn't be surprised that the same is going to apply for your design system. I have seen plenty of design systems that want to start with this outer layer of components, right? Primarily focus on building the assets, but that's not where you should start. I get it. It is one of the first things that you might see in a design system. It is the meat and potatoes. Um, and the folks that are writing the code might want to start here because this is the thing that's directly going to benefit them the most. Uh, but I think these folks are doing a disservice to themselves. Instead, start from the center and work your way out, especially through those first three fundamental layers. Um, if you define your foundations, 
your tokens, your core systems first, uh, they're going to inform how you build the rest of the system. If we were to start outwards with components and work our way in, then we might find that we have to refactor more frequently uh, as we build the different parts of the design system. <laughs> if we were to build a component, or excuse me, a button component, and later we decide to build out a color system with tokens, then we're gonna have to go back and refactor that button as well as any other components that we might have built. And naturally, if you have more complex component, uh, components, they're probably going to need a larger, more complex refactor. Now, this is great advice if you're just getting started, uh, but if you already have a design system and you started with the components, what do you do? Well, you don't have to scrap anything. It's all okay. Um, what you need to do in this situation is to go back to those first two pieces of advice, perform that gap analysis to see what's missing, and then, because we're not playing coverall bingo, identify any of the problems and pain points that could be solved by the missing pieces and then prioritize fixing them. <laughs> All right, and four, uh, documenting your design system language. Uh, talking about design systems can be tricky, right? That's because there are so many terms that we use that have multiple meanings. In this talk alone, I have mentioned foundations, guidelines, and patterns. Depending on which design system we're talking about at the moment, or if we're even talking about the anatomy of a design system itself, those terms can have different meanings, and this can lead to serious confusion. Um, even the words design and design system can have different meanings to different people. Uh, remember when we were looking at lasting design system, I was initially confused by that usage tab in their component documentation. I was confused because I thought the documentation that we were seeing in examples, it seemed like usage documentation to, uh, for me. Uh, this is a case where I didn't understand their definition of usage uh, and that it was a more general usage guideline. Um, so Ben's anatomy of a design system is intended to clear up this kind of confusion. We want to give concrete definitions for the terms that have multiple meanings because it's important for teams to be on the same page. Um, but if you have a design system, it could be difficult to adopt our definitions. The important thing is that you document your definitions. Document your design system language like you would uh, document your brand's design language. <laughs> this could be something that will live within your design system as maybe a glossary of terms. Everyone on your team should be made aware of it. Um, you'll want to include reviewing your design system language with each new member as part of their onboarding process. And once you have your own design system language defined, then you want to document, um, or excuse me, define and document it. You want to do your best to use that language with your team. If terms like foundation and guidelines have separate meanings, then you can't use those interchangeably like other systems might. As time goes on, you're going to find new terms that need to be cleared up. Treat them like you would any part of the design system. Take time to create the definition, document it, and then release and announce it to the rest of your team. <coughs> All right, last piece of advice. Um, and my first piece of advice, right, to identify the problems, um, this is what I believe is the most important piece of advice, right? It directly benefits what is one of the most important and foundational parts of a design system, and that's the people. So we need to have the right people doing the right things. Um, you don't necessarily need to have a design system to have brand consistency across products, but it really does make it easier for the people that have to build those products. It takes some of the stress and worry off of their shoulders so they can figure out other solutions to other problems. So just like you need to have the right people on your product teams, you also need to have the right people on your design system team. Uh, you can't realistically have like a lone person be responsible for your entire design system. <laughs> uh, especially if you have a really large company. Uh, it, but it truly does take a team of people across a variety of disciplines in order to build something that will benefit the other folks in your company that are also in those same disciplines. Um, not only do you need people to design and develop the system, but you need people to work with other teams to encourage adoption. You need people in management 
and leadership uh, positions that are going to invest into the creation of the design system uh, and help champion it. Thank you so much for your time.